بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh And welcome to this 40 something I don't know Let me check 47th episode of the Islamic Fiqh uh, um, short book and we stopped at the pillars the essentials for marriage and the scholars say that the arkan the pillars for a valid marriage are three now you remember we said that there are what is known as pillars there are conditions and there are other things that are mandatory in the nikah in the marriage so the pillars that without the marriage would be invalid are as follows the first one is to have the marriage taking place <clears throat> without having any obstacles so the two parties the wife and the husband should be free of any reason that prevents a marriage and we spoke about that earlier when we were talking about the conditions of marriage such obstacles would be that they are siblings the man and the girl were breastfed by the same woman for example with the conditions of course known as we will come and discuss later on inshallah marrying a woman while being married to her niece or to her aunt this is not permissible the Prophet has some prohibited combining between a, ma a woman and her niece marrying two sisters this is not permissible as mentioned in the Quran in, in chapter 4 Surah An Nisa marrying someone who is of a different religion that we cannot marry from so a man cannot marry a hindu woman a buddhist an atheist he can only marry a muslim a jew or a christian woman and a muslim woman cannot marry anyone who's not muslim so all of these are obstacles that prevent marriage from taking place the second pillar is what is known as proposal and the proposal happens from the woman's guardian and we said that the guardian is the father and we mentioned that this is one of the conditions of marriage to have a guardian but we have a guardian a pillar of nikah of marriage that the guardian gives a proposal by saying I give you my daughter in marriage in the conditions we said proper identification so if he has five daughters saying I give you my daughter in marriage is not valid he has to identify the eldest the youngest her name by a description that cannot be ambiguous this is known as a proposal in Arabic it's called ijab and the third pillar is acceptance al qabul and this is done by the groom or those who represent him now in the midst of COVID-19 
a lot of marriages have been postponed and delayed due to lack of travel, due to, you know, the reasons. So I get a lot of calls from a brother and a sister living in America. And the father is in India or in Africa. And they cannot travel to conduct the marriage. So can they do it through Skype? So the father calls the boy and he says, I give you my daughter in marriage. And he names his daughter. The groom must say, I accept her marriage to myself. So this acceptance is a must. Now in your textbooks, you will find this last phrase after mentioning these three pillars. It says the commitment must precede the acceptance, meaning that the guardian of the girl has to say, I give you my daughter in marriage. I give you my sister in marriage. And the groom says, I accept. If it was reversed by the groom going and saying, uncle, I would like to marry your daughter, Fatima. And the guardian says, son, I give you my daughter, Fatima in marriage. According to our textbook, this is not valid and it is not accepted. Yet this is not the most authentic opinion. Saying it is not accepted is the opinion of the Hanbali school of thought, which I follow. And saying that it is accepted, regardless who initiated it, is the opinion of the vast majority of schools of thought and I am inclined to that opinion simply because the Quran and the Sunnah support it. As for the Sunnah, in an authentic hadith, a man was in the presence of the Prophet When a woman came, stood in front of the Prophet and said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, I give myself to you in marriage. Now, this is known in Arabic, the one who gave herself to the Prophet in marriage. Al Wahiba, Nafsaha. The Prophet looked at her and looked elsewhere, showing that he's not interested a man stood up and said oh prophet of allah if you don't want to marry her then let me marry her so the prophet asked him how much he has to offer as a dowry etc then the prophet said i give her to you in marriage the prophet was the guardian so the man's proposal, or shall we say the man's acceptance, preceded the proposal of the Prophet ﷺ, which supports the opinion of the majority of schools of thought that in normal cases, when we go to propose to a woman in her house, so all the men come from the boy's side and the men from the girl's side are sitting, her uncles, brothers, etc. Then they, they speak. If this is an engagement, they would say, we are interested in your girl. And they would say, you are more than welcome. End of story. Acceptance of engagement, proposal, but not marriage. But if the man says to the girl's father, uncle, I want to marry your daughter, Aisha. And the father says, you are more than welcome, my son, I accept. This is valid and it's a, ha it's a happy marriage. Of course, in the presence of two Muslim male witnesses. And some schools of thought insist on using special terminologies. So they say, you have to say, ankahtuka ibnati, 
or zawajtuka ibnati and he responds by saying qabiltu nikahaha qabiltu zawajaha and they say that if you use any other terminology this is not valid and this is not true if you propose in english son i'd like to give you my sister in marriage or daughter in marriage and the man says whoa that's cool i'm all for it that's that, that's your job he doesn't have to say or accept marrying her any statement of approval does the job inshallah we move on to the chapter that deals over the section that deals with the dowry dowry in arabic means sadaq sadaq or mahar so either way it's the same thing that is paid for a girl and the arabic term sadaq is derived from a root that means truth it refers to the money that the groom must give to his bride in connection with the marriage contract and this is backed by the Quran, by the Sunnah, by the consensus of scholars of thought that no marriage is possible without giving compensation, financial compensation to the woman. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran and give the women upon marriage their bridal gift graciously. With happiness. Don't give the money, the dowry, while you are hesitant or hating that. And Allah says, To those with whom you seek to enjoy marriage, you shall give the, dower, the dowers or the dowry due to them. And the Prophet ﷺ in the previously mentioned hadith of that woman who gave herself to the Prophet when the man ﷺ, when the man said, O Prophet of Allah, if you're not interested in her, marry me to her. The Prophet asked him, what money do you have? And the man did not have anything. So the Prophet said, look even for a ring made of iron. And the man was stone broke, nothing. He does not possess a thing, not a penny. So the Prophet asked him about what he uh, uh, memorizes from the Quran. And he, he asked him about clothes, about a sword, about a shield, anything. When the man said he doesn't have anything, the Prophet ﷺ ordered him to marry her through teaching her surahs of the Quran. And most likely, this was an alternative for something that is tangible, something that is financial. Nowadays, we get rich women insisting that their dowry would be Ayatul Kursi, for example, or Surat so-and-so. This is not something that is recommended in Islam. That was an exceptional case for that man because he had nothing. But for, for those who possess wealth or money, the dowry should be in money or something that is tangible, something that can be compensated and returned just in case the marriage is needed to be dissolved. A woman needs to leave the marriage and files for khula. She has to give back her dowry. But if her dowry is Ayatul Kursi, how is she going to pay her husband back? So it has to be something financial if the man uh, uh, is capable of paying it. The following section. Now, okay, let, let us go back to dowry because the book did not mention these things. Let me try to think of things that might benefit you and they're not mentioned. A lot of the people think that giving the dowry 
is essential to consummate the marriage. In Urdu, they say Rukhsati. So, in order to get the marriage consummated, the dowry has to be paid. And this is not true. The dowry can either be paid in advance. The marriage night is in two months' time. And I give the dowry in advance two months. It can be given on the same night. It can be a loan postponed to later on. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of the men delay giving the dowry until the woman dies. And this I have seen so many times getting questions about this. A man says, or the children say, that our mother died last week and our father did not pay her the mahar, the dowry, the sadaq. So is he entitled to keep it? Or this is part of the inheritance, the wealth that must be divided? The answer is, it's just like a normal loan. It has to be paid off. Now, a word of advice. A lot of the sisters don't need the dowry, so they don't ask for it. However, this is their right in Islam, and it's part of their savings. So, this means that if you got married and your dowry was 5,000 euros and you did not ask for it or take it, every single year you should include these 5,000 euros in your zakat and give 2.5%. Why, Sheikh? Because it's a loan and you're not asking your husband to pay it off. So, either ask him every single year to pay it off to you because this is your God-given right. If he's broke and he cannot pay it, the zakat is delayed, no problem. But if he is capable of doing it, but you're ashamed of asking him, or you don't want to, you have to give zakat every single year. How to escape this? Either he pays or you forgive him. So he tells you, Okay, 5,000 euros, um, inshallah, I'll pay it to you next month. And you say, I don't want it. It's a gift from me. Or you say, well, give me 1,000 euros. I need to do my teeth. I want to buy a, 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 a new glasses and keep the rest as a gift. No problem. Because Allah mentioned this in the beginning of chapter 4, Surah Al-Nisa, that if they are kind enough to give you wholeheartedly or some of your dowry that you'd paid, there's no problem in that. Among the things that needs to be addressed is that in Islam, the dowry is given from the boy to the girl. All financial expenses are covered by the boy. The girls' side of the family do not have to spend a penny. And unfortunately, we see nowadays this trend of imitating the Hindus, where the men live off their wives. We see, unfortunately, a lot of the Muslims, and I, I have come across, or actually I usually get across such issues on weekly basis where the girl says that I married a man and his family they're haunting me every single day for a dowry and I ask but this is not Islamic she says yes I know the area we live in is dominated by Hindus so his family are expecting my family to purchase a flat, an apartment. And this is okay. If the girl's family wants to purchase a flat or an apartment so that they can live without paying rent, no problem. The problem is when they register it in his name, not in hers. This is dowry. 
what did what does he do to deserve such wealth by marrying their daughter he's the one who's supposed to financially provide for her and give her the dowry the house the furniture the walima party of the wedding the whole nine yards this is a man's duty and responsibility but in these countries in the subcontinent india pakistan bangladesh the boy's family due to their hindu roots due to their disbelief or let us say lack of commitment and submission to allah's sharia they demand an apartment and i've seen people demanding a car and not any car they say to the girl's family you have to buy our son a corolla toyota 2021 not 2022 because it's almost over what is this this is so shameful of the boy and of, of his family to demand such things the dowry is only from the boy's side to the girl's side and likewise all financial uh, 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 obligations such as the wedding such as the furniture etc yes if the girls family want to contribute in giving gifts the gifts must be in the girl's name so if they want to furnish her house so they said okay the bedroom the kitchen appliances the air conditionings it's all on us but it's a gift to our daughter so if they were to split she takes everything back to her in normal cases the whole house is furnished by the husband and he's the one who is supposed to um, take everything if there were to be a divorce and this is also part of the shameful acts in these areas of the world when the in-laws the parents of the girl keep the dowry keep the gold of the woman of the bride they have no shame they keep all her gold jewelry gifts mahar and refuse to hand it over to her because she's living in their house and they say we will keep it for you i'm not a child for you to keep it for me you are crooks you are thieves concealing my stuff like this against my will and i have come across a lot of issues where divorce takes place and they confiscate all of her stuff and refuse to give her a penny on the day of judgment they will face allah azza wa jal as thieves and they will be thrown in hell for their major crime which is stealing anyhow what are the material rights this is a big topic and the the book mentions very little um, which is a tip of the iceberg and i don't want to convert this fiqhi book into a course about marriage you can find this free inshallah on my youtube channel where i with the grace of allah did about eight hours maybe 16 hours i, I forgot a weekend course called uh, half deen and i made that in um, india chennai so you can find that watch it maybe benefit from it if allah is willing so marital rights a, ma a valid marriage contract creates many rights for both husband and wife these are one the wife's rights so what are the wife's rights there are so many so many mentioned in the quran and the sunnah unfortunately we cannot yani, elaborate a lot on it just to save time 
So the first right that is mentioned here is the dawi, and we've gone through that. Number two, being looked after. It is your wife's right in Islam to look after her. I don't want to tell you how many in Europe reverse this and they sit home playing with their PlayStation all day long while the woman works, comes back from work, takes care of the children, of the cooking, of the cleaning, and provides for the husband money because he doesn't work. And he seems to be happy with that. And this is shameful. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran, قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض وبما أنفقوا من أموالهم Men are guardians over women due to two reasons one Allah Azza wa Jal has favored them over women two because of their financial spending they're providing for the wives. And this is why scholars say, if a man cannot provide for his wife financially, she can easily leave this marriage and file for divorce. She's not sinful. She's not a charity organization giving without account. This is a marriage contract. You paid money, which is the dowry, in exchange for services. But this dowry is not a one life uh, uh, payment, once in a lifetime payment. This is the first deposit. You have to take care of her shelter. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran to provide from them a housing according to your ability and Allah Azza wa, and the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam that you should be kind to them feed them of what you eat clothe them of what you wear shelter them and never beat their faces and never criticize how they look and if we were to just expand on this hadith, Allah knows how long it will take us. So not only physical abuse is prohibited in Islam, also mental abuse. Look how fat you are. Look how ugly. You. Why don't you fix your hair? Why did you do something about your weight? Why don't you do something about these black circles around your eyes? Why don't you put some makeup, whiten your teeth, do something. I would be like, so ugly, you're as ugly as a monkey. What is this? This is a major sin. That's what it is. And you're sinful. And if you had the guts to look in the mirror and see how ugly your face is, or how bad your mouth smells, or how big your belly is, you fail to see your toes for the past 10 years and you're criticizing how she looks you have a problem these are the rights of women in Islam a wife must be respected must be valued her parents did not bring her up to throw her in a, the garbage where she's living at the moment they brought her up to be honored to be respected they gave you the most valuable thing in their lives. So you should take care of that. And you should be grateful for that. So being looked after, it's not just only food, clothes, medical care, and a shelter. It is also a lot other than that. But these are what they call the tangible aspects. So we have tangible aspects where a husband is obliged to provide for his wife and there are intangible 
uh, aspects. So when, we, when it comes to the dowry to being looked after, the, these are tangible. You can, you know, monetize it. You said, I spend this much and this much. But when it comes to intangible actions, well, the third part is sexual intercourse. A woman got married and she came as a normal human being interested in having intimacy with her, with her spouse. Allah Azza wa Jal described the spouses of being a cloth to one another. So each one is metaphorically the clothes of the other. <clears throat> so it's not a one way street. You desire her, she desires you as well. And a number of men are neglectful of such a fact. Some of them are impotent. They're unable to fulfill their wives' desires due to physical inability or to mental or to whatever. And this is haram because if a woman is in a marriage and the husband does not take care of her desires and intimate needs this is opening the gateway for shaitan to make her fall into sin it's like saying okay i'm not gonna feed you i'm gonna make you starve until you die and when she goes and steals food to eat instead of dying you accuse her of stealing. Now, this is not the right thing to do. We have to protect women from falling into temptation. So it is part of her God-given right to be sexually fulfilled with her husband. Number four, proper companionship and kind treatment. Allah says in the Quran and live with them in kindness. And this is mutual between men and women. So women are also supposed to live in kindness and proper companionship with their husbands. And the husbands are ordered clearly in the Quran. So live with them in kindness means that you don't beat them. You don't physically or mentally abuse them. You don't torture them. You don't do like some quote unquote male companions do to their wives when they restrict their movement to the extent that they say you cannot go to your parents house and your siblings cannot visit you. What is this? Solidarity confinement? This is not prison. Akhi. If Allah gave you the right to be obeyed. Allah did not give you the right to transgress. Allah gave you the right to be obeyed in such in, uh, uh, incidents for the continuity of the marriage. But when you become a tyrant, prevent her from going out and people from visiting her, preventing her from using the phone or the mobile or the internet or anything. This is solid, solitary confinement this is prison the woman is way better off in her father's house such women should file for khulr give me one reason why i should stay with such an imbecile who's if it was in his hand he would have even blocked air so that i can breathe give me one reason this is not a marriage. Marriage is something that is filled with compassion, mercy. Allah Azza wa Jal made it from among his signs that he created for one another, a man and a woman, so that they would shelter to one another. Is your wife feeling that you are her shelter or you are her torment and prison cell number five among the rights of the girl of the wife 
upon us men is to be fair and fairness comes handy and necessary when a person is married to more than one wife if he has only one wife usually by default he has to be fair because there's no one to compare her with but when there is another wife and he has two or more wives here he is being scrutinized and Allah Azza wa Jal stated in the Quran that you may marry a second a third a fourth wife providing that you're fair so if you're afraid that you won't be fair and just between them then only marry one what is meant by fairness meaning that you provide for them equally in the sense that you have a suitable home for each one that you provide both of them with the same facilities that you give them gifts equally and that you share your time with them equally as well and this sometimes is not applicable 100% for example I got married to my first wife after 20 years I managed to build a house a big house and each one of my children has his own separate room and I was well off back then then the need to get married again came up so I got married to a second wife I rented a flat of three or four rooms for her she has no children and now she's complaining she's saying no I need a big villa like your first wife am I supposed to the answer is no am I being fair I said it's yes how am I fair first of all the villa the house was built before the presence of the second wife so there is no equality or fairness here needed it's like saying to me listen your first wife over the durations of 20 years you bought her gold jewelry you took her to countries of vacation now you have to compensate me it's not I have to compensate your thing I did that when she was alone now you hold me accountable after our marriage so we got married first of January whatever I did to my first wife which is not part of maintenance rather it's part of gifts you can have the sh same share so now her house is big requires a hefty electricity bill and your apartment is a quarter of that no problem you're not fair yes I am fair what do you want me to do this is your expenditure her family is 10 people yours is one so I buy groceries and meat in accordance to their number and for your house I buy groceries chicken meat fish whatever according to our number with two of us only so this is fairness now if I go to Cairo for two weeks and I take her I have to give you a similar vacation let's say to um, Casablanca Morocco Arab country Arab country almost the same this is being fair if I were to buy her a bottle of perfume I must pay the exact amount for you maybe a different brand usually but the same money and if the money is different I have to put cash into it and I used to do that when I was married to two long ago 
I used to buy a bottle of perfume to my first wife and it was like 500 reals and the other perfume bottle that I buy for my second house, uh, wife which is as good Coco Chanel and Yves Saint Laurent or uh, whatever but it is 50 reals less so I used to give her the gift with a banknote of 50 reals just to escape the wrath of Allah Azza wa Jal. You have to be fair in spending the time. One night here, one night there. Three nights here, three nights there. A week here, a week there. But if someone says, uh, my first wife has five children, so I have to spend more time with them. So I'll spend four days with them a week. And because you, you don't have children, I'll spend three days. This is haram. Or I say, I'll spend the weekend with you and five days with them. This is haram. You have to be fair. So there are so many things when it becomes a, a part of your life that you must fulfill the rights of your wife. And there's so many rights. You'll find that in um, the course I told you about. And maybe if next time uh, I see it, fit or people ask for it maybe we will we can expand on it a little bit but inshallah this is all what is needed for you guys to learn about so we move on to the questions leaving the rights of the husband to next thursday inshallah azza basiru says if muslim man says quran discriminates women can I call him a kafir? Well, well, this is a very difficult situation. Can there be a person criticizing the Quran? The norm, generally speaking. We have something called takfirul mu'ayyan. And we have the takfir al-am. Takfir al-am meaning giving takfir in general, not specifying a particular individual. So we say anyone who steps on the Quran is a kafir. Agree? Everybody says definitely. You set foot on the Quran, you're a kafir. Anyone who says that the Quran is unfair or unjust is a kafir. Agree? Yep. Anyone saying that riba is halal is a kafir. No problem. Now, when we come to implement these general rulings on a specific individual, so we have here Mr. Abdullah. Abdullah says that while I was walking one day, it was so dark, I stepped on something. So I turned on the light and I found that what I stepped on was the Quran. Shall we imply, implement the rule we mentioned for earlier? Anyone who steps on the Quran is a kafir? Mm, oh, Sheikh, it was an error. He didn't mean it. Bizarmullah khair. Answer is correct. Then he says that due to I was recently يعني, uh, converted to Islam, didn't know Arabic. Once a person said to me that Islam says do this, do that. Quran says do this, do that. And being impulsive and thinking that there's no way Islam can say such a thing. I said, no, this discriminates. This is unfair. But when people told me about it, I came to back to my senses and I said, Astaghfirullah, I was wrong. So is he a kafir? The answer is no. Question number three. If a person says riba is halal, this is kufr. But wait, Abdullah here says riba is halal. Is that true, Abdullah? Says, no, a'udhu billah, riba is haram. It's mentioned in the Quran, the Sunnah, it's, it's haram. 
So, what did you mean, Abdullah? He said, Akhi, riba is haram, but the interest that I pay to the bank in exchange for a loan, this is business. This is not riba. Riba is in gold and silver. I'm taking cash. This is not riba. Ah, so Abdullah's problem is with understanding the meaning of riba, in identifying the meaning of riba, whether this falls under riba or not. But the concept of riba being haram, he has no dispute in that. So he's misinterpreting. This does not take him out of the fold of Islam. So now we come back to your question, Basiru, or Basiru. Uh, if a person says the Quran discriminates women, we sit him down, usually not me, scholars of Islam, Muslim judges, to investigate what he meant by that. So if he says, yes, Islam or the Quran discriminates against women, why would Allah favor men over women? And mentions this in the verse you have just recited, Ar-Rijalu men are guardian over women due to what Allah has favored men upon them why would Allah do this so Akhi, watch your steps carefully are you claiming that Allah is unfair and unjust if he is defiant if he is insisting this means that the conditions are fulfilled. He's not misinterpreting. He's not ignorant. We've shown it to him. He is not having any ambiguity. He did not make any mistake. You know the man who lost his camel in the desert and on it was his food and everything and water. When he realized that he was a dead man in this huge desert, he took a nap. When he woke up, he found the camel next to his head. He grabbed the rope and out of joy, he said, Allahumma anta abdi, O oh Allah, you are my servant and I am your slave. Uh, sorry, you are my servant and I am your Lord. The Prophet said, min farah. He made a mistake out of extreme joy now does anyone say that this mistake would put him in hell no so when there is misinterpretation when there is ambiguity when the, there's no clarity when the man is making a, an error when he doesn't know all of these are conditions and obstacles obstacles from giving takfir but if all conditions were fulfilled and all obstacles were eliminated and the man is, is defiant he's insisting Riba is not haram. And what was mentioned in the Quran is not correct. This is a blatant kafir. However, try your level best to avoid giving takfir to anyone because this is the role of Muslim judges and scholars. They have to identify the fulfillment of the conditions and the elimination of the obstacles. For us, we see people giving takfir day and night. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. My husband doesn't pray. He hasn't prayed for 20 years and he doesn't fast and he always does bad things and he doesn't believe that it is mandatory to do this or that. So is he a kafir? Am I divorced? So she's giving takfir in order to get away from such a marriage. And this is problematic. Giving takfir is one of the characteristics of Al-Khawarij. So be careful from falling into such dungeons. Subair says, why is Islam saying on zina in marriage? This doesn't make any sense, Subair. If you are asking about a married person committing adultery, this is a major sin. If he's not married and committing fornication, this is a major sin. If you meant that they were fornicators 
and got married while being fornicators without repenting, the marriage contract is void, is invalid, they have to renew it. So your question doesn't make any sense, Akhi, but I hope you found your answer in what I had said. Yusra says, a female Muslim, single parent, used the profit from savings certificates to meet the family needs. Now she is repenting and wants to calculate the profit of those years and give it away. How can this be done? Well, she has to go to her bank and check the financial statements or her statements over these years and calculate how much she uh, took from uh, that and try her level best to pay it off. If she is still poor and needy and doesn't have money to pay it off, then Allah is most forgiving, inshallah, due to the fact that she was in desperate need. Sanjida says, is it permissible for a girl to abroad for higher studies before getting married? I think she is um, asking about traveling to pursue her higher degree before marriage. This includes a number of things that we have to be careful about. First of all, if she's traveling, she must not travel without the companionship of a male mahram. Traveling without a male mahram is prohibited in Islam. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, لا يحل لمرأتين تؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر أن تسافر إلا مع ذي محرم. It is not prohibited for a woman who believes in Allah and the Day of Judgment to travel without a male mahram. So he has to be an adult, he has to be male, he has to be a mahram, a man. She can never marry such as a father, a son, a brother, a cousin, a, a, an uncle, paternal uncle, or a nephew, or a father-in-law, or a son-in-law, etc. Secondly, if she is to study abroad, the school has to be segregated. She can't study in a mixed school or university where men and women sit freely, mixing, talking, chit-chatting, boys coming to college with shorts, girls coming in mini skirts. And this is not befitting of a Muslim girl to go to. And she's a girl. She's not obliged to open a house, provide for her husband and children. She's a female. She's to get married, to be honored, and to get her provision while sitting home. Her husband does all the dirty work. So if the conditions are fulfilled, that is, she travels with a male mahram, the university is segregated, or at least men and women don't sit next to each other, don't communicate, and it is safe for her, then this might be okay, inshallah. Adil Ahmed says, when I was young, I did not realize how badly I was transgressing while backbiting. Now I have truly come to realize the wrongs I was committing. Is it enough if I ask Allah for forgiveness or should I ask the people as well as I do not remember who, the, who they were or where they are is it enough to ask Allah for forgiveness? The origin of the problem is that the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, Ya ayyuhannas, O people, whoever wronged his brother, then he must clear it before the day of judgment. Meaning clear it in this dunya. For on the day of judgment, there is no dirham or dinar. There is no dollars or euros or rials. There is only good deeds and bad deeds. Which means that 
you cannot compensate someone else by paying from your wallet like you do here in life you i make a mistake i wrong you in any way i say okay forgive me he said no i'm not gonna forgive you you hurted me really bad I said okay this is a thousand dollars will you forgive me now said, whoa man, i forgive you man so i can buy my way out on the day of judgment you can't all what you have is your good deeds and bad deeds so you start sharing your good deeds not sharing giving away your good deeds to the those who you have wronged and if your good deeds are over but your sins are still you will take from their bad deeds and put it on you and then you will be thrown in hell this is the ideal situation now the only route possible is that you go and meet those who have you had back bitten and say listen forgive me i did this and i did that but the result from such an action would either be oh it's okay i forgive you and this is rare this is like five percent while the majority of people 95 percent of them they would curse you and say may allah Azza wa Jal curse you i don't want to forgive you i don't want to see your face get out of my face and maybe cause more problems so due to the fact that people would rather escalate than to forgive it is advisable that you don't approach them rather you ask Allah for forgiveness you repent and whenever their name is mentioned you try to mention them with good things that are truly in them in order to yani, be a kafara for what you had done and Allah knows best Rabia says, does comparing and saying my family is better than yours or my family knows many things and does better to make themselves look superior over others is a form of kibber and arrogance? Most likely, yes. When you say such phrases that are not called for, there's no reason for it. You just simply say that my family is bigger than yours. My family is richer than yours. Why are you saying this? To belittle you, to make you false, feel small, to look down at you. This is utter and pure arrogance, which is a major sin. Lyric says, can one fast the six days of Shawwal, Mondays and Thursdays, and have the reward of both fasting the Shawwal and the reward of fasting Mondays and Thursdays? The answer is yes. Most Muslims I know of, they have 30 days of Shawwal. So they fast Mondays and Thursdays, Mondays and Thursdays, Mondays and Thursdays in the first three weeks. And they have accomplished two birds with one stone. Fasting the six days of Shawwal and fasting Mondays and Thursdays according to the Sunnah. No problem in that, none whatsoever. Second question. Question. Here in my country, the messages now are open, but with some restrictions such as leaving the mask on while praying and keeping the distance like two meters between each other. Is it better to pray at home, including praying Dhuhr instead of Jumu'ah, or should we go to pray in the mosque with these kinds of rulings? I've answered this so many times. So the final answer would be, that social distancing in prayers is an issue of dispute. There are three or four major scholars in Saudi Arabia who say that due to necessity, it is permissible. And there are scholars that say that there is no real necessity. Give me a break. We go to the supermarkets, we go to the uh, uh, shops, to the malls, and we are like half a meter away from one another or sometimes shoulder to shoulder we're wearing masks but nobody says anything when it comes to the masjid you tell me to stay two meters apart what is this and this is for COVID-19 it's not a plague it's not a real uh, uh, a pandemic that kills the millions 
worldwide, like the Spanish flu, for example. No, it killed what? 300,000? 1 million person worldwide out of 1.7 billion? This is nothing. So the necessity that necessitates this social distancing and prayer does not seem to be genuine and real. But due to the fact that major scholars did give the fatwa, if you feel comfortable with it, you, mo you may go and pray the normal prayers with the social distancing. There's a fatwa in that. If you don't feel comfortable and you don't feel like you are in a masjid, especially with the mask on, and with your prayer mat and with the social distancing might as well feel better praying home this is up to you so there's no problem but i would recommend that friday would be attended because this is once a week and you can pray outside usually inside would not be enough for a uh, room for the people to pray so there's no problem in uh, attending it inshallah and you pray outside and it's it's only once a week and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Afrina says in the subcontinent it's a common practice to give salam to the elders by bowing uh, and touching their feet especially on weddings. Please uh, say something on it sir. This is totally prohibited. This kind of humility must not be expressed to humans. Bowing down is a ritual that can be only devoted to Allah Azza wa Jal and not to humans. So this is not permissible to comply with. And the final question is from Muhammad Hamayyan says, the woman hair that are no longer part of her head, should she bury it or can be thrown out? So this is a misconception. A lot of the people think that when a woman or a man cut their hair, that they should take the hair and bury it. But there is nothing in the Sunnah, nor in the Quran, supporting it. So it can be thrown in the dustbin without any problem, inshallah, azza wa jal. This is all the time we have. Until we meet you, inshallah, next Thursday, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.